I hope everyone got the hand out. So that's her objective. 
and I just quoted, online representation provides rural young people with materials for crafting what it means to come out as LGBTQ or questioning in rural context. And I, I highlighted three parts in this sentence, which will be the three main aspects we will be looking at in today's representation, in today's presentation, sorry. So the first thing is online representation, what, what it means to be online. This has to do with the mass media as well as the new technologies. The second thing is about rural young people. So they are young people instead of uh, as opposed to adults. And the third thing is about coming out as LGBTQ or questioning uh, teenagers. Okay, so these three um, aspects. So first thing, uh, before we get to that, let's take a look at the method she used and the data she collected. So this is a 90-month ethnographic ethnography study, which means that it's basically uh, observation, description, and then come to a possible explanation and evaluation. And uh, the way she contacted uh, these people, I think it's mainly through email. But there might have been some other ways like telephone calls. And then the second thing is this in situ approach. And we will come to that right after this in the next slide when we're talking about new technology. And as for the data, uh, it's rather unspecified. It's, um, she didn't really mention how uh, these, how she find uh, uh, these young people, but they are shown here and there in the article. So you can see that here are three of the examples. Basic, um, of course, there are names, pseudonyms, probably, and there are age and where they come from. So these are the most important elements in this study because they're young people. As you can see, they are 15, they are 19, or 17, and the region. So the first one, Amy, lived in the state of Kennedy. The second one, uh, it's not mentioned, but the third one, Darren, who lives in an agricultural town. So these are some of the most important elements when she's collecting data. They have to be teenagers in their teens. They have to be um, the residents living in or studying at some of these uh, areas away from cities. And there are times when she mentioned their sexual orientation or their race, and especially race, this will come to uh, the, one of the focuses in later discussion. So, first thing about media and technology. So what's wrong, or what are the problems when we try to discuss media and te technology? Well, the first thing is that in mass media, so like we see, uh, rural lives is rarely depicted in mass media. So here we can see another quote, these images teach rural youth to look anywhere but homeward for LGBTQ identities. Most of the time what we see in these media images are set in urban context rather than rural context. So when these young people are trying to look for their identities or trying to identify with something, they will have to look at something in the cities. And that also means that they will have to kind of leave their hometown behind. But that's not necessarily what they want to do. They might want to retain, like keep their connection to their hometown. So that's the first problem. Uh, the media representation is kind of difficult to do the idea of rurality. And the second thing is that when most scholars, well, parents, are uh, dealing with new technologies, they usually have these um, ideas that the 
presumed properties of the technology themselves to the exclusion of the social context that gives technology meaning. So what does it mean? It means that uh, we usually think of technologies as something that produce effects or something that has inherent power to be good, to be bad, to be evil, to be ugly. And uh, uh, this is evidenced in a way that some people, not just some people, most people would think of technology such as Xbox that as a kind of sources of distraction, of violence or allure to ch children or teenagers. And that also led to the institutionalizing of uh, some uh, like censorship. Like they would think of technology, it's it can be bad for teenagers. Um, but the problem with this presumption is that technology itself does not have these effects or powers. Instead, they should be uh, examined when they are put in the social context. It is when they are in the social context that these technologies are given meanings. So that refers to what we just talked about, the in-situ approach. It cannot be you know, excluded, it cannot be removed from the social context. So, it's, so rather, we would see how it is embedded in the social context. And another problem that comes with the approach of treating media as an escape or media as spaces is that these approaches are unable to explore how rural, queer, and questioning use engage and transform media. So basically, when we are thinking of media, like online, uh, cyber, or virtual spaces, we think of it as an escape from the reality. Like, oh, I'm tired of my life. I'm going on to I'm going online to think to seek something else. Um, but the problem is that uh, the there is no clear cut distinction between offline and online. It's usually interwoven. Yeah. Um, and again, back to what we just talked about, that these rural youth queer they don't want to leave their hometown. They don't want to, they're not like, okay, I want to leave Kentucky. I want to go to university. No, they want to stay in their hometown. They want to stay home and keep that network. So we don't want to approach this as uh, an escape, like they don't want to leave the life they're leading right now. So. Instead, we try to think of media as a kind of tool between online and offline experiences. So here, Grace cited Mame's uh, study. Online spaces are intimately interwoven with the construction of the off uh, offline world. So think about it. When you, uh, when you log onto Facebook, it's not like you're completely uh, uh, away from your real life. Most of the time, you take a little bit uh, or pieces of your real life and post it on your, um, your Facebook status. And when you see your news feed on Facebook, you also get to see something that is happening in real life, right? So. It's not like offline and online, they are separate, they are inseparable. And that kind of reminds me of something. Uh, I was reading this book called Gator Culture. Actually, I have this in my backpack. Uh, it's by Molavacus, published in 2010. So he cited Shaw's, one of Shaw's article in 1997. Uh, here it says that relationships formed within the exterior gay community lead to the users to the exterior CMC community to where they in turn develop a new relationship which are nurtured and developed outside the bounds of CMC. So this basically means that uh, the relationships formed outside of community, 
computer mediated communication can be taken into real life and vice versa. And this is an actual brief book. Like the entire book is devoted to this uh, investigation of how media or online like websites or apps are used as tools um, when they are like shifting in between. Like sometimes they are online talking to someone in the online community, but other times they kind of connect with this to the world outside of the online world. And the second part is critical use study because we're doing this young people, right? So this is based on new childhood studies, which criticizes the developmental paradigm that frames young people's identity practices as playful exper experimentation. What does that mean? It means that there is this assumption that uh, when we are looking at young people's identity construct or identity work, we usually think of it as, as a face, or something passing, something that is not, um, not <coughs> mature. This is a rather adult-focused, adult-based uh, worldview. We think of this from the perspective of adults. So we think of uh, what ch children are doing or teenagers are doing as something just you know, playing around. But uh, what new travel studies and critical use studies are doing is that they try to acknowledge what teenagers are doing. They are doing this. They are taking it seriously. And their identi identity work is really giving credit. In the second part, we will see how this um, uh, contrast is being made. So, urban versus rural, where the question is used. So, in urban area, what they're doing is usually independent and self determined It's characterized by this self determinedness And there are usually urban-based resources and social services in the city. Think about it like we're in DC here, okay, of course, you have that. But what's going on in the rural areas? It's not exactly the same. So instead, they are inter interdependent, which means that there is a network for them and they cannot be isolated. Like they are not independent. Instead of an individualistic approach, they are usually interdependent with each other. And that kind of leads us to think that there are young people after all, they are financially dependent on the family, right? And also, they usually look for queer adults, advocates, or non-LGBT allies when they are um, building their networks or finding a place in the community. And the second part is that great Turned it as a collective labor, that is, the identity as a work shared among many. Again, here she's emphasizing that this in rural areas, identity work is never something individual. It's not just what I want to do, what I'm doing, or how I do this, but it's a collective work by the whole community. Like everyone is doing their share and they co-construct what it means to be queer in the rural areas. And finally we come to the third part, the last part, what it means uh, to be queer, queer realness. So first we just borrowed uh, the idea from Albert's time in her 2005 article Realness is the way that people appropriate the real and its effects. So basically it means that how we think of what is real, how we perceive the reality, and how we uh, negotiate its influence on us, how we think of it, it, its impact on our life. And also she borrowed Middle's uh, idea of discursive practices 
and this approach focused more on audience members' experiences, like how they, uh, how the audience perceive the patterns with a text, but it go also goes beyond that. It investigates how they use them, how they recycle them, how they recycle these things that appear in mass media and rework them. And lastly, uh, Bauman's idea that people telling stories to each other, constructing and negotiating social identity. So it actually works two ways. Like people, when people are telling stories, they are making meaning of themselves as well as the world. So that usually uh, accompany the constructing and negotiating of social identity. And it's vice versa. When people are trying to negotiate their identity, they are usually storytelling. Like, I'm going to tell you a story in order to build that identity. So that kind of all come together right now. Is it? <laughs> For example, if I were to tell you that, OK, I'm gay, I'm bisexual, I'm transgender, then it's not just what I want or what I want to do, but rather it's a negotiate. It's a process of negotiation, like whether you acknowledge what I'm saying. So it's this co-construction. So here are some of the websites uh, in this article, and they are like chat rooms. You can you can look for. Uh, you can browse through these pictures. Okay, oh that guy is hot, so I'm gonna talk to him. Something like that. Um, okay, I'll just skip that because it looks <laughs> like that, just like that, nothing different. And here's another one, but it's. It's interesting though, like this gay.com uh, is still in operation, like I just visited yesterday, like it's still there, but this one is no longer there, so it kind of uh, corresponds to what we were talking about, like a lot of the websites or these online resources aren't permanent, they might just disappear or fade out uh, in a period of time. So when I try to look for Mongenic, it's not there. And the last thing, what we're talking about, about uh, these young people, queer young people in rural areas, family is their, like, the core of their life. It's not like they want to leave or escape from their hometown or their family. Instead, they want to keep this connection with their family or the place that they are familiar with, such as their school or other settings. So when it comes to uh, identity construction in rural area, it's always about familiarity. But there is something else that they can look for. It's called reference groups. It's usually, so for them, it's something that's online. So for example, they can go online, chat with people, go to chat rooms, and find someone else who shared the same things with them. And that's how they find their reference groups so, and connect to a larger network. And here's something that is important when we are talking about this reference groups. Our inevitable alignments with multiple audiences lead us to violate the norms of one reference group no matter what we do. Which means that when we are trying to identify with these groups, we inevitably uh, violate the norm, which means that we are not no longer aligned to another group. So it's usually that it we find ourselves in this conflict of alignment or uh, you know, inability to align with different groups. So here is a case uh, of Brandon. He is an African American in rural areas. So he worked his way up 
to, a, to the leader in the school as um, like the speaker or the leader of the African American organization, uh, but coming out to him, to him coming out becomes a problem because when if he decided to come out, that means people will see him as a gay rather than his uh, racial identity. You know what I mean? Like that's what uh, Shikunani was talking about. Like for Brandon, he has different reference groups. He has to make alignment to different groups. He has to be uh, in his African American organization. But at the same time, he also wants to fulfill his identity work as a gay or bisexual uh, man. So that's why he can go online and look for gay outlet as he uses it. So this quotation is what Brendan said during an interview. So he said that I could read personal stories about people my age, my age telling their parents about their feelings. I could even find room for chatting with people living near my hometown. So it means that uh, for them, this online experience is, is an outlet for them to construct their identity. But at the same time, it means that they don't have to abandon their uh, their hometown or their uh, racial identity, for example. They can still maintain that. So that leads to the conclusion. These genres of queer realness, online coming out stories and electronic personal uh, such as including online coming out stories and electronic personal ads expands their sense of place, home, and belonging within queer social worlds. So they can stay at their hometowns where they are comfortable, where they are familiar with, but at the same time they can uh, find their queer identity online. Okay, so that's how, uh, according to Greg, how they combine their online experience and offline ones. So, any questions? I think we should go to the, just Work, let's workshop? look at the questions, but then we'll go to the workshop, otherwise we won't have time. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, these so, let's are leave it up, because it may be relevant mm -hmm. to what you're doing here. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.